All right. So thanks for joining us today for our live demo series um, where we present recent data breaches or hacks, how they were executed, and what you can do to remedy this from happening in the future. Um, so today I'll talk about a recent hack that happened to an official political campaign and how it exposed hundreds of millions of records of American voter registrations. And before I begin, I just wanted to say this will be a technology focused discussion. Um, we at Data Theorem are not affiliated with any political parties. Um, so in this particular hack, we'll talk about um, a researcher, his name is App Actor, and he gained access to private voting data by inspecting and querying a database used by a third party API service in the app. Um, so before we begin, let's talk a little bit about voter security and data statistics. So. Um, this has been a point of increased sensitivity and concerns around like voter security and political anonymity. And, um, you know, we're seeing that there's records on the dark web, 100 million voter records on the dark web um, from, you know, international actors. There is now starting to become an increase in states that are going to use paperless voting machines. At the same time, we're seeing a lot of people planning to vote by mail in this election. Um, and, and really what this is bringing up is that, um, you know, even though some of these voter files are public, um, they do include basic information like a voter's name, their home address, their contact information, which political parties they have been registered with. And even though these voter files can vary wildly from state to state, um, we're seeing that there are certain firms trying to um, boost up their databases with having data from other sources to target swing voters, for example. And either way, all of this data, because it's of such high interest um, to hackers, um, you know, this is this is data that can have high impact on the individual. So at the end of the day, this is about data, not politics. But, um, you know, the fact that there's hundreds of millions of records of interest here, that's a high impact situation. And so when something goes wrong with one of these apps, let's see what the headlines look like. So this is the one that we'll be talking about today. It's most recent. Um, this was a bug in Joe Biden's campaign app and it gave access to some of the voter files. But then um, earlier this summer, the Trump app actually, um, it found that the Trump app was collecting a lot of data um, and you know has all these permission requests and is, and is capturing data, like for example, more than just your general location, but down to your street address. Um, and then they, they had actually found some other issues with the Trump app where it was actually storing keys on the client side. Um, so it was, they're, they're making a lot of errors with that app as well. But um, today we'll be talking about the Biden app specifically. Um, so basically the bottom line here is that um, both campaigns and apps rely on a third party API service. It's called Target Smart and it houses up to 191 million voter records, which is effectively everybody in the US who's registered to vote. Um, now in this particular situation for the Biden app, it's called Vote Joe. Um, there was a very quick turnaround, a four day, three to four day turnaround. So um, from the day that they were alerted of the issue, to the day that they fixed it. Um, basically, there are four, four days there. Um, so, you know, they, they're able to fix it quickly, but really what this is, it was a full stack attack and it had several authorization and authentication violations. Um, this is primarily due to this API backend. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but APIs share information and PII by design and not enforcing the proper authentication in the API endpoints can lead to data leaks. So um, let's talk about what this looked like at a high level. So from an app to the cloud, um, typically in a full stack application, you have a client side app. It will be mobile or a web app. So mobile would be like iOS or Android and web would be a single um, page application, SPA. And then you'll have, in some cases, you'll have hundreds of APIs um, pulling data from a database to the client and from client to a database. And so this kind of data transfer done by an API, it's happening all the time in the app. And there are ways once you're in the app to actually 
see which API endpoint is being called or used. And uh, once the, the data is, is pulled into the database, there's also security concerns there, like is it being um, secured properly or is it stored in a public uh, storage bucket or something like that? If you're an app developer and you're using a cloud service provider, microservice or um, cloud building blocks, you really need to be aware of security concerns there as well. So basically for the Biden app, uh, he had his, uh, vote Joe app, and then he had this uh, Target Smart API on the back end, and then that Target Smart API was leveraging their 191 million database, but at the same time, they were using inputs from the client end. They have they call it like an intelligent platform where they're constantly iterating and, and providing new dashboards for the app itself to share with the user. Now, this means that they're providing additional insights on top of the database based on user inputs, and I'll talk more about how that showed up in the app itself. So. Um, what did the hacker, well, in this case, it was a researcher, um, the app actor, but what did he actually do and, and what did he notify um, the app developers? So um, the first thing that he noticed was he could actually register with a false account. So there's a low barrier to entry there. Uh, one issue here is that, you know, if, if you would expect that uh, this kind of voter file data might be limited only to uh, those who are part of that repository. Um, in this case, you could have an international uh, actor or hacker come in and register and then gain access to all this data. Uh, the second thing was that he was able to remotely access information through the API gateway or through the API endpoints. And that's where uh, he was able to find all of this unsecured uh, personal information. So he did get this public voter file data in some cases that is public but then he went one step further and ran queries against a database that pulled out information that is not public and that's where the concern lies so what happens when you set up the app when you sign in so what the app is effectively called they call it like a relational uh, app or they call it relational organizing. So they're encouraging you to log in and sync with your contacts in order to kind of notify your contacts and tell them about this app and help them get involved. But what happens is once they're looking through your contacts, they're, they're um, cross reference referencing information about your con contacts with the information in the database to verify, you know, what, what information is in the database and what's what's a real contact. And so what that does is that um, you can have a fake contact in your address book, sync it, and then you'll get the real contact in the app. And so what happened was um, he was able to go in and check and see um, you know, what kind of responses he got with this get voter response. And then he got some minimal detail. But once he got set voter response, he was able to see actually their birth date and which county they were in and their actual street address. So what started out as a fake contact actually ended up uh, pulling information about a real voter data. And so you can imagine if he wanted, he could put several names in here and, and get real voter data that way. Now, the other thing that happened was uh, once he was in the app, he was actually able to look into the database and see information like which election that they voted in and which election they didn't vote in. And then once he ran another query, he was able to examine the JSON object and the way that it was stored, it said like, yes, a Y for yes, they voted. Like you can see on the right hand side here, the 2018 um, election, yes, they voted, but then you can actually go on to see they had this B and R thing, which uh, we can assume means Democrat and Republican, how they voted in the election. Now that is private data that is not available publicly at all in any voter file. So this is a this is a really harmful thing because um, not only can it lead to like identity theft, or it could also lead to like social engineering attacks or any other attacks like that because you have all this information about an individual and you can target them. And then another thing to mention here is like let's say somebody logs into the app and they're not um, they're not a a U.S. citizen or they're not registered at all and they're getting all of this information about um, someone that they can then use to target them in some way. Um, so 
Uh, all of this can be very detrimental both to an individual. Um, and again, this isn't about politics, this is about data, because if you're building an application that can pull this kind of information, you have to be aware if you're pulling on a third party API service, um, you should be aware that you know maybe it's maybe it's your code, but maybe it's also the third party code. Either way, you need to protect your client at the end of the day. So um the other thing to mention here is, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of apps collecting data every day. You're probably using a lot of apps and you've probably opted in because with GDPR and CCPA, we're getting these requirements to opt in or opt out. Now, you always need to have the option to opt out. And in the app, they did mention here they are selling this information, um, you know, so that's something to be aware of. And that's true for any app, not just this app. Um, but it, it's interesting here that you have the the option to opt out, but it can take like up to 10 days and um, they have to be able to verify your identity. So it's interesting that the barrier to sign up is pretty low. You don't even need uh, to have a real email address, but then to opt out, you have to prove your identity. So that's kind of um, interesting. Um, so the conclusion here is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues and concerns, hard to say who's at fault, but it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, querying the voter data with the JSON object, return proprietary information about the voter, who they voted for, when they voted, um, you know, it included information like the voter's home address, other sensitive information. Um, and this information might have never been inputted by the user. It was just collected via another user. So not even being able to get consent from people in your contact list who you're then entering their information uh, without their consent. Um, you know, all of this information is then uh, provided to Target Smart um, to kind of boost their database and then help them provide dashboards that everybody else using the app can see to illustrate trends. So that's an issue as well. Um, not having any authorization or authentication checks is a problem. Uh, and then again, all of this kind of leads to one thing, which is, uh, you know, this is uh something that can really affect your client at the end of the day and it can hurt your business you know if, if you're building an app and and you have clients it, this is something that is really really important to protect and so how can we help right how can you prevent this from happening so uh data theorem is a full stack application security program and we run automated hacking and we prevent data breaches um and you know, we we really zoom in on which P1 security issues lie in your app and how you can uh, prevent them. So security P1s are vulnerabilities that allow remote access uh, of yours or your customer's data along with any app store blocker. So if you've ever tried to publish your app to the app store, um, you might've gotten a blocker where they say, oh, you have to fix this or you know, your, your app isn't approved for publishing. We'll check all of that as well at minimum. And then we check much more of that as well. Um, and this is how our, uh, our, our program works. Um, this is the analyzer engine. And so it basically has three parts to it where we run discovery, exposure, and remediation. Uh, we run a uh, discovery uh, among all of your app elements. So whether you're using APIs, whether you have any, um, cloud building blocks or using CSP elements or microservices, we'll check all that as well. And then during inspection, um, we actually also enable you to set what you consider as your priority, uh, security concerns. So we'll actually flag these as your issues. If you've set this, um, it, we call it policy groups, um, but you know, you can actually go in and, and we'll, we'll provide the information about, you know, what kind of vulnerabilities you have. Um, and the automated hacking that we do, we have a few uh, attack toolkits, hacking toolkits. Um, so we have like hack and extract where we'll try authentication authorization hacking attacks, and then we'll try to tease out any private data, um, like the PII that we mentioned today in this uh, recent breach. Um, and then for detect and inject, we'll run like SQL injection attacks. Um, and then we also flag any like leaky APIs, um, anything that could 
you know, that where you haven't turned um, authorization or authentication on. So we're, uh, we're constantly checking all these things through our auto automated hacking processes. And then during remediation, you actually have the opportunity to auto remediate in some instances. So um, if you just press one button and you can fix it right away on in other instances, we'll actually provide you secure code suggestions. So this is kind of what it looks like in our API discover um, section and our API secure product. Um, we'll inventory across all of your apps, APIs, gateways. Um, we'll identify like what we mean by cloud uh, assets or cloud building blocks is things like queues, containers, cloud storage buckets, things like that, uh, serverless. So we're, we're scanning all that stuff if you're using a CSP. Um, and then asset grouping is, uh, you know, what I referred to earlier, where you can actually uh, group some of these building blocks into different projects, and then you can assign the policy depending on what you care about most and what you want to see flagged as a priority issue uh, when you open up your dashboard. Uh, inspection, uh, this is where we'll enforce those custom policies and, and where we flag it. Um, we'll also evaluate any of the leaky data and we'll run these hacking attacks. So we're basically taking the perspective of a hacker or a researcher and we're doing the work that they might do um, for you. So maybe you haven't thought of all the ways that your app could be hacked. Well, we've done all that work and we're able to uh, show you the results right away. Um, and then with the remediation, we have the auto triaging, like when you open up your dashboard, you'll see right away the priority issues. Uh, as I said earlier, remediation, you can run auto remediation, which is um, pretty convenient. And then reports, a lot, of, um, a lot of companies are concerned with compliance and they're getting audited quarterly or maybe even more often. With our scanner, uh, you can actually run these kinds of uh, audits more frequently with like a click of a button. And we actually have compliance reports where you can get information about different types of compliance regulations and how your app aligns to those. So uh, that's another thing that we can do with our product. 